Rugby World Cup all tied up. And dead chuffed. Success comes from playing with a train set. Good evening. Two schoolboys from Wiltshire have been found guilty of killing a former schoolmate. They attacked him as he left a party in his hometown of Salisbury. Their victim, 16-year-old Jonathan Sims, died from a brain hemorrhage four days after he was discovered unconscious in the street. A third schoolboy was acquitted of his manslaughter. During the case, Winchester Crown Court heard allegations that Jonathan had also been the victim of bullies at school. But today, an education spokesman said the school did not intend to investigate the bullying claims because they had no reason to take the matter any further. Keith Akehurst reports. Jonathan Sims was attacked within minutes of leaving a 16th birthday party in Salisbury last October. He was followed, ambushed and attacked in Bedwin Street. He was punched and kicked unconscious. Disorientated, vomiting and in pain, he was rushed to Salisbury Infirmary. He was eventually put on a life support machine, which was switched off four days after the attack. The court heard that one of the youths told police he punched Jonathan. I was the one what hit him about six times. The second boy, in a statement, admitted kicking him. The post-mortem examination revealed Jonathan had probably been killed by a blow to the head just behind his left ear. The court was told that the boys, then 15, had a grudge against Jonathan ever since he stepped in to save his brother from a beating. In court today were his family and school friends. It was quite at school. He was, you know, going to his work. One of the best boys in the class, I suppose, never causing trouble or anything. He's a really nice bloke. He's just lovely. He's just a really nice person. I just really loved him. Ever since I knew him, we didn't, didn't start a fight. He'd always sort of walk away. He'd never run. But, you know, he'd always turn his back from trouble. The convicted youths attended Highbury Secondary Modern in Salisbury, which Jonathan left at 16. It was claimed in court that fights and bullying were a regular feature of life at the school and that Jonathan had been a victim an allegation denied by his family. As far as we know and as far as our son spoke to us, he's never been bullied at school. He was always well liked. Um, he was just cheeky, but you know, he was never bullied, never. He was the sort of boy that would keep out of trouble, Jonathan was. The jury took 100 minutes to reach their verdict. When it was read out, the two youths wept. Sentencing was deferred for social inquiry reports. They were remanded in custody for two weeks. I want to see some sort of justice to make me happy. No community service, rubbish like that. That's too easy. And they're talking about their children's lives. What about our child's life? No, it eats you. Keith Akehurst, Coast to Coast, Winchester Crown Court. A political row has broken out today over the closure of a Gosport factory and the loss of 740 jobs. Union leaders at Ferguson say the French parent company closed the plant rather than one on the continent. The union claims it's easier to put people out of work over here. Steve Harris sends this report. As the Ferguson workers emerged from the Gosport factory, they were still stunned by the shop closure announcement and clearly very apprehensive about their futures. It's, it's really gutted at the moment. When, when do you turn doing. next? You don't. There's nowhere to turn, is there? you just got to take things as they come now in this climate. We're not in an easy climate. We're not in an easy environment down here. You know, Perham and Gosford area are depressed as it is for work. And at my age, I don't envisage finding work very quickly. I don't know anything about unemployment or Dolbert uh, situation for you. I have to go down and find out, you know, see if you get any benefits, etc. and then shop around and find something else. Well, I'm a one-parent family with a little girl to bring up, so... I just have to keep my fingers crossed, maybe try for somewhere else. Trade union leaders met plant managers this morning but claimed they knew little more about the decision except the factory would close for good in January. However, they've now been promised top-level talks with the French parent company, Thompson, next week. We need to have a close analysis of the paperwork, the, their financial figures. We need to look at the, the other plants. A lot of this work will be sent to other places in Europe. We need to see why it's going there and why why have they made the decision to close us and perhaps not another plant in Europe? Um, is it because they, their relations, for some reason, it's easier to close plants in England? I suspect that it's easier to close plants in England. Local shops have also been badly hit. 
that's going to affect us quite badly because we send a, a boy over there every morning to sell papers. All the girls come in on the way to work to get their papers, their cigarettes. You know, so, um, I mean, obviously it's going to affect us all. When there's a recession going on, we all can't afford to lose business, can we? Steve Harris, Coast to Coast, Gosport. Watching that report with me, Peter Vigors, the Conservative MP for Gosport. Mr Vigors, the Chancellor Norman Lamont told the Conservative Party conference this week, the green shoots of economic spring are appearing again. Those words are going to have a rather hollow ring in Gosport, aren't they, tonight? Yes, and the workers have every justification in feeling very bitter. Uh, 703, in fact, jobs to go, um, they state and a loss of 700 pay packets in the, in the area. And the fact of the matter is that despite the talks you're going to have, it's highly unlikely, is it not, that anything will be done about these losses? Well, I'm very concerned about the high-handed way in which this decision was taken. As recently as last Monday, the general manager was assuring workers that their productivity and flexibility was now making sure that the factory was actually working on a profitable basis. As recently as May of this year, I wrote to the chairman in Paris asking him to divert more work to the factory. and what received did you no, say? I received no reply. Peter Chegwin, um, the Liberal Democrat leader of, of the Council at Gosport, says you could have done more. Is that fair or unfair? Well, what I will do with others, and I've spoken to union leaders this afternoon, is to seek to put together a statement of community concern to show that all of us are deeply concerned about the proposal to shut the plant. Is it easier like to, sh to, like to, to shut a, is it easier to shut a factory in this country, as we've just heard, than it is abroad? Is this well, a fact? Well, it's an easy allegation to make. In fact, the uh, Thompson factory is closing two of its uh, factories, one in Spain and one in the United Kingdom. And I understand there is very severe overcapacity in the television manufacturing industry. What we must make sure is that the French management knew all the facts and know all the facts now before they decide to persevere with their decision, if indeed that's what they do. And I'm entirely behind the union leaders in their discussions with the French decision makers. Can I ask you something? Why is it when clearly industry in this country is in a very, very serious condition, why do Conservative MPs continually go on saying recession? What recession? I don't think anyone says that. Uh, we all know that time is very difficult, times have been very difficult, and it's been difficult for companies in my constituency to carry on. Most are doing moderately well. Uh, smaller businesses are suffering, I know that. It is true, as Norman Lamont says, that the green shoots are showing, but it's still, there is still overcapacity in some areas, and unfortunately, television manufacturing is one of them. And no green shoots showing in Gosport at the moment? Well, well, we'll fight to make sure that all the facts are known, and we'll test this decision very hard before it's actually implemented. Peter Vigors from Gosport, thank you for joining us. Hundreds of dogs in the south, including pit bull terriers, may have to be put down because they've not been registered. The deadline set by the government for registration of dangerous breeds runs out tomorrow. The RSPCA say many perfectly healthy animals face a death sentence and their owners could be fined heavily or even jailed. This report from Fiona Oates. Dogs like this pit bull terrier will be destroyed if they haven't been registered with the police by tomorrow. Three-year-old Bruce is lucky. His owner has registered him. By doing this, he will receive a certificate of exemption and therefore avoid being put down. The Dangerous Dog Act covers four types of dog, the Pitbull Terrier, the Japanese Tozer, the Dogo Argentino, and the Filia Brasiliaro. In order to obtain his certificate of exemption, three-year-old Bruce is being neutered. He is then given a tattooed identity number. This number corresponds to that of a microchip implanted permanently under the dog's skin. The microchip can then be read on a monitor. In this way, it's hoped owners may be traced if the dog is involved in an attack. It's a simple, straightforward procedure. There's no reason why people shouldn't keep their animals, but they have to comply with the law. You say you've done about six or seven pit bulls so far. Are you surprised that you haven't done more? Yes, I think knowing the area fairly well, I'm very surprised there aren't any more um, being presented. Well, I think if they value the life of their dog, uh, they've got to get it registered fairly quickly. Uh, I think the police are looking on this as a, a serious problem, and I think they'll be monitoring it fairly, fairly well. The cost of this operation for neutering and tattooing is between 100 and 200 pounds. But that's not the end of the expense. The dog must also have third-party insurance against attacks. 
This pit bull called Floyd lives in Portsmouth. He was the first in the country to get insurance cover worth two million pounds. The cost of that is 50 pounds a year. It's estimated that there are 10,000 pit bull terriers in the country. According to the Home Office, so far around 3,000 have registered. In Portsmouth, less than 40 pit bulls have been registered. Following today's reports of a court case in which a judge ruled that a crossbreed pit bull didn't fall under the Dangerous Dogs Act, the RSPCA admit owners may be confused. For those individuals who are not sure as to whether the pet that sat by the hearthside is a pit bull terrier or not, the answer is go along to your veterinary surgeon and find out. If you're in doubt, do that. If it is a pit bull or looks like a pit bull, then it will be covered by this act. And unusually in British law, the obligation is upon you to prove your dog is not a pit bull terrier rather than the courts to prove that it is one. If owners don't meet tomorrow's deadline, they will face a £2,000 fine and up to six months in jail. And their dogs will be destroyed. But it's hoped the legislation will avoid incidents like this. Fiona Oates, Coast to Coast. Well, now let's catch up with more local news from your particular part of the TVS region with Debbie Middleton and Fred. Police have issued an artist's impression of a man they want to question about the murder of a woman in Sussex. 51-year-old Marion Rilke was knifed to death in her home at Hogarth Road in Hove. Ray Kemp reports. This is the face of the man police want to interview about the savage murder of Hove housewife Marion Rilke. He was seen visiting houses in the Hogarth Road area on the day Mrs Rilke was killed. Several householders said he called on them asking for directions to non-existent roads. He's described as being in his mid-twenties to early thirties, five feet nine to five feet eleven inches tall, of average build with brown shoulder-length hair and with a very pale complexion. The other thing that was distinctive about him was that he had a, a blousome type jacket. Now on this jacket, it was a dark colour, on the jacket there was embroidery with little flowers on the breast up high on the front, at that aside. Now that was very, very distinctive. Police believe Mrs Rilke's killer was heavily blood-stained when they left the scene of the murder. The likelihood is that the man or woman who killed uh, Mrs Rilko would have been bloodstained. And what we're asking is for anyone who knows that person or for anyone who came home, uh, a loved one, a close one, somebody you're living with, somebody sharing a house or a flat, who came home on the 2nd of October bloodstained to please contact the interview room at home. It's now over a week since neighbours discovered Mrs Rilko's body. Police hope the artist's impression may bring them closer to solving the crime. Ray Kemp, Coast to Coast. Hove. Meanwhile, a 40-year-old man has been charged with murdering his wife in Dorset. Christine Preston died of a fractured skull. Her body was discovered at their home in Broadstone on Wednesday night. She worked at a nearby bank. Terence Preston will appear in court at Bournemouth tomorrow. A widow in her 90s is being treated in a hospital burns unit after being rescued from a fire at her home in Brighton. Nigel Burwood sends this report. The charred windows of the terraced house show how fierce the blaze was when 94-year-old Mabel Murray was dragged to safety. She was rescued by her 56-year-old lodger, Fred Rousel, who also suffered burns. Staff from the pub next door tried to help. We came out and we saw Fred, the lodger, was um, actually bringing her just to the door. Um, one of our regulars and our barman, Kalan, managed to get her carry her down the path with the help of a couple of other people. Fred was scorched on the back of his head and it looked as though he was burnt on his back as well but the old woman seemed more badly burnt especially on her legs and on her hands and he... she was in hysterical shock really badly. Mrs Murray's burns were so severe she's now being treated by specialists at East Grinstead's Queen Victoria Hospital. Meanwhile fire investigators are still trying to discover how the blaze started. Nigel Burwood, Coast to Coast, Brighton. A decision just to reprimand a Winchester prison officer who allegedly smuggled in fake guns has been condemned by one of the South's MPs. The officer has been disciplined by the governor but told he won't lose his job. Basingstoke MP Andrew Hunter is to ask the Home Secretary, Kenneth Baker, why the officer has been treated so leniently. A prisoner found hanging in his cell on the Isle of Wight had been wrongly branded an informant. An inquest has today heard that Kevin Hole, an inmate at Parkhurst Jail, lived in fear of his life. Some thought he'd informed on a prisoner at another jail. The inquest is continuing. Tommy, the cinema cat, has died after being attacked by a group of youths. 
Tommy, who was 17, lived at the Odeon Cinema in Brighton, where he was a favourite both with patrons and staff. But three youths trapped him in toilets, Tommy. repeatedly kicking him. Tommy has now died of kidney failure. A memorial plaque to him will be erected. Well, the party conference season drew to an end for another year as the Conservatives enjoyed their final day at Blackpool. All eyes, including those of our Brian Shawcross, have been on the Prime Minister today. Isn't that right, Brian? Yes, it is. And representatives from the South Fern have been concentrating their minds on the effect John Major's speech would have as the climax to the Conservative Party conference here in Blackpool. It had to be something totally different from anything Mrs Thatcher had done. And it was, as Guy Phillips now reports. It was a dramatic break with tradition, the Prime Minister making his way through the audience as he entered the hall. The conference organisers determined to cash in on his image as a man of the people, and Mr Major himself determined to spell out his vision for the future of Britain. I spoke of a classless society. I don't shrink from that phrase. I don't mean a society in which everyone's the same, or thinks the same, or earns the same but a tapestry of talents in which everyone from child to adult respects achievement, where every promotion, every certificate is respected and the person's contribution is valued. I thought it was a, an effective, thoughtful speech and a very interesting contrast with Neil Kinnock last week, which was a rant. A first-class speech, I think it was, it, it really confirmed him as Prime Minister and leader of the party in the eyes of the nation and the party as a whole. I think it's just what the country needed and just what Newbury needed. It shows that he identifies with the people. It was John Major's day today, but the rest of the week will be remembered for two people. <laughs> Mrs Thatcher returned to the stage for the first time since she was ousted as leader. A five-minute standing ovation and Michael Heseltine, winning back the hearts of the Tory faithful. We shall, we shall win that election on our record, on our principles, on our philosophy, and the time to start is here, and the time to start is now. Michael's one of the few cabinet ministers who's got that common touch. He can really get the crowd behind him. He can absolutely tear apart the opposition. But today, the glory belonged to John Major, with the party now hoping it can win the next election. Guy Phillips, Coast to Coast, Blackpool. Well, Brian Shalcross has been following the entire party conference season. So, Brian, how well have the Tories done compared with Labour last week? Well, Labour had a highly stage-managed euphoric conference in Brighton, so the Conservatives began in very much defensive mood until, really, they had a very successful speech from uh, William Waldegrave on health, then, of course, Michael Heseltine's rabble-rousing stuff. There was still something missing, though, until John Major's speech today. He really had to deliver the goods, and he's not the great orator that Neil Kinnock is, but nevertheless, he did deliver the goods, and I have a suspicion that engaging smile of his will be a great election asset as the campaign builds up. So full marks to uh, all the party conferences. They've had good conferences, but because uh, the Conservatives have the last word, they'll probably benefit most. But how worthwhile are all these party conferences, really? I mean, can they help the Tory MPs in our region who are perhaps in marginal seats? I think they help tremendously to boost the morale of party workers who come to them and go off fired with the message. And they also help reinforce the message to the, the wider audience of voters who actually watch them at home. I think they're worth a few points in the opinion polls. Ah, well, after Mr Major's speech today, how will that reflect in the opinion polls, do you think? I'm sure well. I mean, one must remember, Fern, all these events are now essentially media events. The speeches are to the wider world, the standing ovations are to the wider world to show the support that uh, the, the, the party gives its leaders. And they're certainly going, I would absolutely be certain that the Conservatives after this week, the John Major speech today, will go up several points in the opinion polls. Well, Brian Sharkos, you can pack your suitcase and come home now. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. Thank you. Two sisters are recovering in hospital in Portsmouth after a life-saving kidney operation which went ahead without a blood transfusion. Karen and Jackie Dallas are both Jehovah's Witnesses. Their strict religious beliefs prevent them receiving anyone else's blood. Staff at St Mary's Hospital used revolutionary techniques to help them, as Sonia Legg now reports. Karen Dallas and her sister Jackie have a bond between them that's stronger than most. Karen has saved her sister's life by donating one of her kidneys. 
but the religion they share nearly prevented the transplant going ahead. They're both Jehovah's Witnesses, and their beliefs gave staff at St Mary's Hospital a problem. It is our biblical belief from our study of the scriptures that it is one of God's laws that we abstain from the use of blood, any blood, animal blood and human blood, and we wouldn't want to compromise God's laws. To donate a kidney uh, from a normal person and uh, subject that person to the risks of a major operation um, without the prospects of being able to give blood um, certainly added to my concern. Most major operations require several pints of blood, so Mr Wise had to borrow a special machine which allows a patient's own blood to be washed and returned to the body. Luckily he got it for free. But is it right to make special arrangements for someone who refuses regular treatment simply because of their religion? With a patient who has such a bleak future, uh, it's entirely ethical to uh, do what you can. But I think it opens up an avenue for everybody to enjoy that. If people can have that extra specialist treatment, which is obviously available if you ask for it, then I think it can only benefit people. The operation ended three years of hell for Jackie. It was risky having it without a transfusion, and without it she'd have spent the rest of her life on a dialysis machine. But even that prospect didn't make the Dallas family question their beliefs. The Bible explicitly tells us that we must abstain from blood. And uh, if you're going to have a faith, as we have, then you must live the faith. And it says quite clearly in the Bible, in, in many places, I'll show you if you like, that you must abstain from taking in blood. Whatever the rights and wrongs of their beliefs, Jackie knows she'll never forget what the hospital and her sister have done for her. She always said she'd give her right arm if I needed it, where she's given her right kidney. I don't think it's really any, any more or any less than anybody else would do for a member of their family. Wanted to see that she could enjoy a normal, healthy life like she did three years ago. Sonia Legg, Coast to Coast, Portsmouth. We wish Karen and Jackie a speedy recovery. Mm. Coming up in part two of tonight's Coast to Coast, facing up to a happy future, thanks to the South's plastic surgeons. And Thomas the Tank Engine, just the ticket for a Hampshire businesswoman. Thanks to the Russian floating eye clinic, Sarah's eyesight was fully restored. Thanks to Barclays, a complex currency transfer was one operation her parents didn't have to worry about. Barclays, when it matters most. Take it from someone who knows. You want to impress the ladies? Open fires. Can't go wrong. Flickering flames, the heat, they love it. And because this one's gas, I've got it all at the touch of a button. She loves it because it looks just like the real thing. Joanne, would you go get some more coals for the fire? Sure, honey. Get some. Don't you just love being in control? That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> For the walls in your home, a silk finish is a little too shiny. And a matte finish a little too flat. Try new vinyl soft sheen from Dulux. Capturing that subtle, natural glow, it will bring a unique softness and warmth to your home. Soft Gene from Dulux. 
As the autumn leaves begin to fall, so do the prices in your Southern Ford dealer's automotive sale. To clear the path for our new stock, prices are tumbling on our 1991 models, like a saving of £800 on this Orion Encore. And the Sierra Chasseur Saloon, with alloy wheels, spoiler, and stylish interior, is reduced by £750, and these savings are before your own dealer's knockout price. Southern Ford dealers, where a great deal costs you less. Welcome back. Mention plastic surgery and most people think of cosmetic operations helping top models to look their best. But in reality, plastic surgeons spend 80% of their time improving quality of life for people with disabilities, perhaps after an illness or a serious accident. Over the next four weeks, we shall be following the progress of two special operations, one a breast reconstruction. But tonight, though, the patient is a tiny child. This is the story of three-month-old Stacy Hull. She's one of 700 babies born each year with a cleft lip or palate. John Hobby is going to make sure she grows up to be a beautiful young woman. Most prospective parents say, I don't care if we have a boy or a girl, as long as it's healthy and perfect. David Hull, and his wife, Shelley, were no different, but late in her pregnancy, Shelley began to have doubts. She thought she detected a hair lip on her unborn daughter during a scan. I had my scan, and I was watching, and I could, you know, I thought I saw it on the scan, and um, when I come out, I said to my mum that I thought I'd seen it, and she said, don't be silly. And then I told my husband when I got home, and he said, oh, you know, it's just your imagination. And then when she was born, and they said she had an hair lip, I just, it wasn't such a shock. What does a hair lip mean? Um, it's just when the two parts of the skin on her nose aren't joint, they, you know, the skin goes right up in her nose, inside her nose. It's not properly formed. Stacy's lucky. She doesn't have a cleft palate, too, where the roof of the mouth is missing. Most often, both conditions happen as a chance thing, but there is occasionally some hereditary evidence. The risk of having a second child with the same problem is slightly increased, but generally nobody seems to know why it should happen. Now, what do your friends and relatives say when they, when they first saw Stacey? Um, they was upset, but they didn't take the mickey or anything. Has it caused her any problems? Um, when we first brought her home, she was OK, but as it's, she's grown, it's got bigger. And to start her on a bottle, it takes time and she, she loses, you know, gets in a temper. Do you think it's uncomfortable for her? Yeah. At three months, Stacey is now the perfect age to have her lip operated on. The NHS offer the surgery automatically. What will the surgeon do? He said that he would cut it and then stitch it back together. He said it may need a piece put in. He doesn't really know until he's done the actual cut. And if it needs a piece put in, where does he get the piece from? Um, I don't really know. He didn't, he didn't, you know, he didn't say. I think he'd take it from her, a skin graft, I think. Not really sure. 